There are so many books out there to help us in so many aspects of our Christian faith. I've got a few just behind me. But today I'm going to give you a top 10 of the best Christian books ever written. Right here, right now. Hi, welcome to the channel. My name is Dan Beasley and this channel is all about inspiring intentional discipleship, helping you to grow in your faith and to share that faith with others, to become what God called us to be, disciples of Christ. And today I'm going to give you 10 amazing books. And some of these are written a few hundred years ago, but they have stood the test of time. Here behind me are just a few books that I've got. Um, I've also got loads of e-books as well. But these books have inspired and helped so many in their faith. And these books are looking at different aspects of faith. This isn't the definitive top 10. This is a top 10. But these books are classic and they are amazing. And, you know, get them because they will help you grow so much in your faith and your discipleship of Christ. So just bear with me, my notes are just to the side, so I'll be looking off camera a bit. I tried to record this uh, before and it didn't quite work, so this is gonna be the best way. So let's start at number 10. Number 10 is a book called Paradise Lost by John Milton. Now, John Milton was an English poet in the 1600s. Uh, England had just had a civil war. Um, he was with the Lord Protector, so we got rid of our Queen and we had this Protector, and it was all political turmoil. Uh, Milton's life was shaped by personal challenge and national crisis. Um, an amazing thing that Milton was completely blind when he wrote Paradise Lost um, and battled political controversy as well. So it's written right and mixed the months of the worst parts of his life. So what's it about? Uh, Paradise Lost describes the fall of man in Genesis 3 and all the events that preceded that um, and all the events that followed this uh, real changing uh, event. Much of the content um, such as the sub themes and conversations are fictionalized, um, but they are fictionalized in order to con convey the overarching themes of the story and to really bring those out. Why is it important for us today? Milton's really clear about the purpose of Paradise Lost. It is to justify the ways of God to men. Nearly everyone has had the experience of asking why in the face of confusion, evil and pain. Um, Paradise Lost faces her questions and places man in his proper place before God. So those people who are out there or as a Christian, if you're facing those questions, this book will really help you understand uh, Genesis 3 and what is happening in that. Number nine is Divine Comedy, written by Dante Alighieri. Hopefully I got that right. He was an Italian poet in the late Middle Ages, and Dante is widely described as the father of Italian language, and his comedy is considered one of the most influential works in the history of literature today. It's not only a Christian book, but um, really accepted out there in the world, which is just amazing. What's it about? Despite the term comedy, uh, the divine comedy isn't intended to be funny. The word comedy describes the Greek classical style, um, which describes work written in the vernacular. Um, comedy is usually end in a triumphant way though, so that's a good thing. This poem describes a fictional journey through hell and to heaven in which Dante observes various characters, experiences different levels of punishment and of rewards, such as Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso. Why is this book important for us today? Divine Comedy was never intended to be an accurate description of the afterlife. It was, however, intended uh, to describe a personal spiritual journey to finding God. As such, it explains to us God's justice, explains also why we are so far from God and our depravity and the things that we do and that he is the only source of salvation to us. So a really brilliant book um, for new Christians or to understand our 
faith or just to go back and remember. Number eight, and uh, you're not too distracted, but this is so much easier than what I was doing before. Number eight is Orthodoxy by uh, G.K. Chesterton, uh, written just over 100 years ago. He was an English Catholic writer and he wrote so much. He was so prolific. He wrote 80 books, hundreds of poems and stories and 4,000 essays. And also he wrote plays as well. What's this book about? Chesterton uses the word orthodoxy to sum up the Apostles' Creed, perhaps the most widely accepted confession of the Christian faith and obviously the Nicene Creed is uh, uh, based on that and adapted. So this was the first creed agreed uh, by uh, the councils of Christians and we say it to this day. Chesterton doesn't um, attempt to end any denominational quibbles over the Apostles' Creed but instead drives directly at the heart of the issue. How do we make sense of this world and what should we do about it? And that's what he's writing into. This book is uh, richly autobiographical of Cheston's life. But a quick warning for you out there, it's an intellectually rigorous read. So you might want to take your time over this. Why is orthodoxy important? Orthodoxy is a thinking person's search for meaning. Today's modern culture encourages curiosity and truth thinking, but often sidesteps the monumental significance of Christianity. How true is that? Chesterton presents the modern reader with his own journey from intellectual curiosity to convinced Christians. So this is a, a really great book to give those who are more intellectual out there um, to read. Uh, maybe they don't know Christ and say, why don't you read this? And this is a person who wasn't a Christian, who is very intellectual and has come to know faith. Also, we should read it as well, even though it might challenge us. Number seven um, is Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, written by Jonathan Edwards. And now I've been out running and I listen to books and I've listened to this one as I was running. And it's a really good, really, really challenging book. Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan back in the 1700s, um, wrote widely during his pastoral uh, missionary career in New England. His works fill many volumes, but this one short sermon is his best well-known work, but also check out some of his other stuff because it is amazing. What's this book about? Jonathan Edward wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God actually as a sermon, and he preached this uh, in Northampton, uh, not in England, but in Massachusetts in the USA. And this sermon explained that hell is real, something that is so, so denied today. That God's wrath is active towards sin and that Christ is the only source of salvation. I love listen to this book because it just speaks it as it is. Why is this book important if you couldn't work that out already? The sermon is one of the most influential in the history of Christianity. God used the sermon to spark the great awakening in North America. If um, you want to preach a sermon that does that, um, maybe start here and read this. Number six is one that I never heard of before uh, researching for this episode, but it's The Life and Diary of David Brainerd, edited by Jonathan Edwards and written by David Brainerd. Jonathan Edwards was a, an American theologian and he collected and edited uh, this diary of his contemporary. David Brainerd was a contemporary of Jonathan Edwards and he uh, did missionary work to the Native American Indians. So what is this book about? Well actually it's the diary. It's a it's a records of his journey and his personal journal um, that's brings out David Brainerd's all-consuming passion to preach Christ um, to the Native Americans. And he did this all in spite of the extreme difficulties that faced him. And he pressed on, uh, and it comes out in his diaries of how he uh, got to preach to the unreached. And he says uh, in a quote, 
All my desire was the conversion of the heathen and all my hope was in God. God does not suffer me to please or comfort myself with hopes of seeing friends, returning to my dear acquaintance and enjoying worldly comforts. This guy went out there. Uh, would he come back? Did he expect to come back? That quote tells me not. Why is this important? Well, Brainerd's life served as the inspiration for the first missionary movement. Brainerd was willing to whisk everything to obey and follow Christ. The evangelist, actually, John Wesley, encouraged every preacher to read this book. And I love John Wesley, so I'm going to um, take his advice and read this book. And one thing that's really important, probably people listening to John Wesley, is... Um, a lot of future missionaries cited this book as being the inspiration for them to go out and do that mission. So this really is one to encourage us uh, to get out there and be more missional. Probably not like him, but in our context and how we can do that in our context. So we got to number five, and this is The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm actually listening to this on uh, my phone at the moment. Um, I downloaded it. Now, Bonhoeffer uh, was a Lutheran pastor, and his career um, and his pastorship was shaped by, obviously, the Second World War and his resistance to Hitler. He was eventually hanged and martyred in a Nazi concentration camp just days before the war ended. So what's this book about? Well, throughout the, so what's this book about? Throughout his life, Bonhoeffer could not escape the, the need for Christians to engage with the world, and especially in his context in Nazi Germany, to follow Christ, uh, meant to resist the forces of evil, both through living it out and also through speaking it out. The Cost of Discipleship explains these scriptural truths and it's based on Jesus's Sermon on the Mount and that's the framework for the book. Why is this book important? Because in today's culture of cheap grace and entertainment driven Christianity, Bonhoeffer, even though it is written uh, just before the end of the war caused Christians to live the level of radical discipleship that Jesus Christ preached, saying, Cheat grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession. Cheat grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ. This book, even though it is written in the context of Nazi Germany and he actually died just before the end of the war, is still so relevant today. And the churches are throwing out th that cheap grace instead of telling Christians there is a cost to your discipleship. Number four is actually a relatively new one compared to some of the others. And it is Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Now, he's a Canadian theologian and evangelist and writer of the Anglican tradition, which I am from and also he went to the same theological college that I did. So what's the book all about? Knowing God is an extended study on the character of God. The chapters explore various facets of God's identity including his wisdom, his wrath and his grace. So why is this book really important? Because Knowing God is one of the most readable and powerful books on God's character out there um, and far from being real dry and factual knowing God is really soul searching and worshipful and that's why it sold millions and that's why it's in Christianity Today's top 50. Um, if you really want to know who God is um, and, that, and that is really important this is the book to go to to know who we are worshipping and loving. And we go from one of the newest books back to the oldest book that we have on the list and that's um, Confessions by Augustine of Hippo. Augustine in the late 300s and early 400s um, was one of the most earliest and influential um, Christian writers and thinkers out there and later people like Calvin and all that were very influenced by Augustine's writings. What is Confessions about? Confessions is Augustine's spiritual autobiography. It describes his journey from rebellious youth to a devout pastor. And the Confessions is really deeply uh, meditational 
and devotional in the way that it is written and it, it is really an amazing story of how he became a Christian and his life before. Why is it important? Although it was written over 1500 years ago, Confessions is brimming with relevance today. The reason why Augustine battled sexual immorality and he was you know a player he doubled with false religions and faced actually heresy when he became a Christian um, and these are all um, issues that Christians today face nothing changes being a Christian no matter uh, what context you were or what time you were from and this book is so relevant um, if you're facing those and everybody is so this book is relevant to every christian number two and one of my favorites and one of my favorite authors is um mere christianity by c.s lewis now lewis was one of the greatest uh, and most influential christian thinkers of last century obviously wrote the chronicles of narnia including the lion which in the wardrobe all out there as films now why is mere christianity important well this short book describes the basics of christian faith lewis first explains the situation of the entire universe then explains doctrine by doctrine what christians believe he doesn't shy away from explaining and defending christian behavior which is awesome and even going deep on several occasions of the most perplexing doctrines of the trinity so um, not just happen non-christians and people who don't believe but also helping us and the way that he writes is really easy to understand even though he's speaking about really complex things why is this book important Mere Christianity spells out the basics of Christian life in plain language and with powerful argument. In Christianity Today's most influential book survey, Mere Christianity was nominated more times than any other book. God used this book to bring so, so, so many people uh, to faith. Phrases and passages from this book have had a massive impact um, in Christian music, such as Sixpence Nut and the Richer and... Um, also outside music other writings so this book and it's really impacted me and i think most people know about c.s lewis and mere christianity and that's why it's number two but it didn't quite make it to number one on this list what is number one on this list so number one is a pilgrim's progress by john bunyan uh, i remember a, a lecture at my theological college saying outside of the bible one of the most influential and the best books uh, that he would have um, if he had a choice of one would be this one and and this is such an amazing book um, written in the 1600s um, during his lifetime in Anglican England there was a lot of persecution of people who were not in agreement with uh, the church policies because we've just um, left the Catholic Church and set up our own Anglican Church. Um, John Bunyan was a non-conformist so he didn't want to conform to who the Church of England was and believed that obedience was to God and his conscience was more important than obedience to man's rules. As a result of his corrections um, he was imprisoned for more than a decade on this. Could you imagine, could you imagine that today with all the different denominations and how we think of church policies uh, spending 10 years in prison but he did um, Bunyan's spiritual journey um, which actually is described in another book called uh, Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners um, led him to many deep insights regarding faith and fellowship as a result he wrote dozens of tracts pamphlets sermons and books and a pilgrim's progress was one so what is pilgrim's progress about the pilgrim's progress is actually an allegory um, meaning that it is a story with a deep layer of spiritual meaning rather than hide this meaning bunyan carefully explains the interpretation of each of the allegory events in the book the story revolves around a man named christian his problem uh, is the huge burden that is on his back, um, another allegory, the weight of sin. So Christian um, wants to flee from one city, the city of destruction, to another one that he's heard, the, the celestial city. And Christian embarks on this uh, dangerous journey to seek relief of his burden and to find the celestial city. And this is um, the book going through that whole journey why is this book important well 
It was published in 1678 and Pilgrim's Progress has never ever been out of print to this day. Pilgrim's Progress is viewed as one of the most greatest works of religious English literature. Spurgeon uh, read the book more than a hundred times and if you don't know Spurgeon check him out. Baptist preacher had done so many great uh, writings himself, um, used to preach to tens of thousands of people. And if he's read it over a hundred times, then we should at least read it once. Um, C.S. Lewis also wrote a significant sequel to A Pilgrim's Progress, more than 200 languages and has been read millions of times by so many Christians out there. And that's why it's number one. And that's why you should read it. So there's the top 10 a top 10, not the top 10. Uh, which ones would you put in the top 10? Which ones haven't made it into this one? Write in the comments below um, to share which ones really inspired you. It could be an old one. It could be a new one. Um, it doesn't matter. It's all about helping us grow in our faith. So contribute by putting it in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the episodes uh, coming up. There's going to be some amazing stuff coming out. Give the video a like so uh, more people will get to see it and hopefully be inspired by these books. And I will see you soon. <music> Heavenly Father, we thank you for these books on this list. We thank you that they were written uh, because of people's love for you and wanting to share that faith in many different circumstances. We thank you for the lives that have been changed and we thank you for the lives that will be changed because of these books. We also pray for many new writers to rise up to write classic books that will continue to share your love and faith for many around the world. And we pray this in all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>